Good morning. I'm going to stand over here so I can see you all a little bit better. I'm pretty short. Um, <laughs> just so excited to be here. Um, some of you may know, you may not know, I grew up here at Bethel. Um, so being able to come every few years and see so many familiar faces and so many new faces really just brings so much joy to my heart. <laughs> and um, I know it is a place of rest for my family as well. We look forward to our time here. And I just want to say a huge thank you for those of you that have been praying for us for the many years that we have been on the mission field. You have prayed over each of our children. You have prayed over our ministry. You have prayed over each camp and all the young people that we work to share God's love with. And so thank you so much for praying and enabling us to do the work that God has placed on our hearts to do. I'd like to introduce you to our family. Actually, we have a few of our kids here and my wonderful mom um, here. This is Lucia and Samantha. Um, on the slide, um, you can see the rest of our family. Our eldest son, Micah, who looks like Tarzan at the moment. He is living in Australia. Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> He's in Australia um, studying, um, but the rest of us are here. We have two in the um, children's ministries this morning having fun, playing with Play-Doh. Um, but this is us. We have been on the mission field for oh, 20 years doing Young Life. We live in the country of Lithuania. Our ministry began in Belarus um, many years ago, and um, we reach out through our team. We reach out to 250 teenagers each week. Our heart is to reach out to those non-Christian teenagers who would never go to church, who would never know where a church is to be found. And we just believe that God has a plan for these people. And, and we have a heart to train up Christians within the local church on how they can reach out to the young people in their own country. So you can see where we live on the map there. You can see where we have um, ministry happening in seven different cities throughout Belarus and in Lithuania. And it's actually been a bit of a hot spot the last couple years in Belarus. The president there has been in power for 30 years. Um, they do have elections regularly. Um, but a couple years ago, the elections were found to be unjust and unfair. And so we saw thousands upon thousands of Belarusians rise up in protest from the unfair elections. And unfortunately, what we also saw was the government clamp down in harsh penalties, arresting thousands of people who are still in detention um, and it being held as political prisoners to this day. Um, just a couple months ago, we saw where the Belarusian government forced the landing of a commercial airplane to, in order to arrest a journalist who was working to bring in free media, free news, into Belarus. Um, and also we have a, a, what we would call an artificial refugee crisis happening in Europe, where again, the Belarusian gov government has flown in many families from the Middle East, and they are physically forcing them to cross the borders into Lithuania, into Poland, and um, it, it is causing unrest. I just share this so that you know that over the last couple of years, there has been this spirit of unrest in the area, and we all know about things happening in Ukraine. And I just ask that you would continue to pray, that you would pray with discernment, that you would pray with power, that the Lord would continue to move through all these things. We know that his spirit is moving and his word is truth. And we pray that over this region of the world and that there would be no fear, but that there would be peace and that the church would rise up and be an influence, that they would be salt and light for their communities at this time. So thank you for, for praying with us and supporting us through this time. Um, you know, the last couple of years with COVID has been crazy. I'm sure um, you guys experienced a lot of changes and we did too. Um, you know, we, Mark would be traveling once a month into Belarus training local people. And it was wonderful because, you know, they would be able to meet um, in the next slide you'll see. This is what a typical training session would look like um, where everyone's able to gather and share their stories and encourage and strategize um, for what's coming next. And of course, with COVID, all of our meetings turned to this. 
I think that's a very familiar sight for everyone. <laughs> it's been a discouraging time in some ways, and we've all battled with the fatigue, anxiety, and depression, I think, of being isolated at times. But what we are seeing is the Lord moving despite all of this, and we are seeing it lives being reached. And so we just thank you so much for continuing to support us. Mark has a lot of stories to share with you about um, more what is happening on the ground in Lithuania and in Belarus. And you guys are so much a part of what we do. And I just hope and pray that you will be inspired to continue to pray, to continue to rise up because your prayers matter. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna let Mark take it over. Well, match made in heaven. What can I say? <laughs> beautiful wife, beautiful life. And it's great to be here, to worship with you in person. And for those online, wonderful to be worshipping with you online as well. As Lyra alluded to, 25 plus years of ministry and the last three have been the most challenging we've ever experienced in our lives. And it's kind of interesting that when these pressures come, when, whether it be man-made, whether it be something the Lord might have brought about, or whether the enemy is attacking, we must ask ourselves, will we be steadfast in our faith and continue? Or will we stop? Will we, will we falter? Will we question and doubt? Will we allow fear to overcome? Or will we allow, in our weakness, the Lord to move powerfully? And I don't know about you, but I could say not only has uh, the last few years been difficult for ministry, but it seems that, like no other time before, there is a division that is taking place. The world of us and them in every sphere of life, whether it's politics or culture, geography or economics, there seems to just be this us and them taking place. And it's a question of breaking through these barriers. How in the midst of this situation of division, how do we love and how do we reach our neighbour? And this is a question that Missions has asked for millennia. How to cross these barriers? It's something that started in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and they hid themselves from God God set about crossing barriers and boundaries in order to pursue those who were estranged from him. And today we can say that has not changed. So I want to bring our attention to a very familiar passage found in Luke 4. And I want you to ask the question of yourself, will I allow God to use me in missions, whether that be to a foreign land, or will he, or will I allow him to use me to reach my neighbour? So, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter four, starting in verse four. Jesus was heading towards Galilee, and he decided to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near a plot of ground. Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Jesus, or when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? 
for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks for you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who draws, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a well of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So Jesus said, Go and call your husband back. I have no husband, she replied. You are right when you say you have no husband, Jesus said. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you are now with is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation comes from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And and they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman finally said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will be able to explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. A very well-known passage. But what does it all mean? And how can we apply to our lives? Is God's word going to speak to us? And to understand this passage more fully, we need to look at the geography. And so looking at this map of Israel, we can see that the west of the Jordan River is divided into three regions. In the south, we have Judah. To the north is Galilee. And right in the middle is Samaria. Now, 700 years before Jesus was born, uh, the Assyrian king, attacked the region of Samaria. And he took away most of the Jewish population. They were sent into exile. And then he wanted to colonize Samaria. So he sent other citizens from Samaria in. And over a period of time, through intermarriage and the foreign gods that the Assyrians brought, a new religion was born, the religion that the Samarians believed in. It was part believing in the one true God, Yahweh, but they also believed in every other God of the land. A bit of a contradiction considering we know the very first commandment is, you shall have no other God but me. And so right from the beginning, we can see why the Jews had a problem with the religion of the Samaritans. But after a few hundred more years, through this disdain, the Samaritans and the Jews betrayed one another, there was conflict, there was wars, there was attacking of temples in Samaria and Jerusalem, to the point now where there is a deep-seated hatred. And that hatred ran so deep that no good Jew would enter into the territory of Samaria. But here we find Jesus and the disciples, maybe the disciples were on their very first short-term mission trip to a foreign land, to a people who believe in a different God to what they believe in, who practice a different faith. The Pharisees, Sadducees and scribes definitely would not have followed Jesus. And here we have the very first precept 
to missions. And that is, missions is about crossing barriers. Whatever is stopping the gospel, whatever is an obstacle, missions looks to overcome. Whether you go around or above or through, we believe that God is a missionary God and he wants his kingdom to come upon the whole earth. And so we see that right here. Jesus has crossed these barriers to meet people where they are. And this is something we do in young life. We ask the question, where are young people who never come to church, where are they hanging out? Let's go to them. What are they doing? Can we be a part of that? Can we go to them and be Jesus? We cross geographical boundaries, ethnic boundaries, cultural boundaries, religious boundaries and political boundaries. We won't allow any of these physical obstacles in the way of advancing the gospel. But it's not easy. I love in John 1 verse 14, the message translation says this, the word, which is Jesus, became flesh and blood and he moved into the neighborhood. Isn't that a great translation? The idea of moving into this neighborhood is everything that we as believers in Jesus Christ should be about, whether it's here or abroad. So what does that look like? What do we train our leaders to do? I want to introduce you to one of our leaders, Pasha, or Paul in English. This is a common sight where you'll see a young life leader surrounded by a group of non-Christian teenagers. And initially we're building a friendship. We're looking for inroads and possible doors to open to spiritual conversations. And all throughout Belarus and Lithuania, wherever we have trained our leaders, they are doing this every week, twice a week, three times a week. They have been the hands and feet of Jesus to a lost world. In the next photo, you'll see a photo of club. This is a weekly event. We would normally do it in person, but because of COVID, we had to meet online and get very creative. It was difficult. We were going into uncharted territories. We were asking the question, is God in this? Because we understand we're all about relationships and community, but here we're having to do it through technology, and it was hard. But you know what happened through this? A whole group of atheists and skeptics came online into our forum. They would never come to church. They would never go to a youth group. And they would never come to an event that we would do that was specially designed for non-Christians. But instead, here they are online. And we learned their story. They're a typical group of teenagers, mainly male, who after school, they go straight to their bedroom and they go gaming and chatting online. And that's their world. And they don't know who Jesus is. The atmosphere, their language, cause us to question, should we invite them back? But we came to the conclusion, even though it's difficult, these are the ones that need Jesus the most. They're the furthest from the kingdom. And so how could we stop? And so it's been difficult, but oh, so worthwhile. And they come back every week. Even though they declare, we don't believe, they come back every week to hear about Jesus. And it's just wonderful. Wonderful to see our leaders doing this. Wonderful to see that we can train a group for the next generation and they are training others and doing likewise. Because Jesus did that. And this is what we're called to do in missions as well. And the next we see in this story of Jesus' interaction with a Samaritan woman he uses the topic of living water. It's kind of interesting because in chapter 3, just before this, he talks to Nicodemus about being born again. Why is that? It's because it was, he was right there by a well. And this is something Jesus did all throughout his ministry and especially John brings out, bringing the physical and the spiritual realms together. He would use the everyday life experiences of the people as a way to talk about the kingdom of God. And so we try to do this too in everything that we do, to be creative. And so you'll see 
in these next few photos, we use as the topic of astronauts and fishing, and we use Mario Brothers and, and, and food as a way to bring about spiritual truth. And our team is oh so creative. Just recently, I loved what we did with Luke chapter 1, where we talked about Luke was sent by Theophilus in order to investigate, is Christianity true? Is what I'm hearing right? And so Luke went as a private detective, and he interviewed eyewitnesses. And so every time we met, we said, you have an opinion on what's right and wrong, or what's true or not about the gospel? Let's hear what the eyewitnesses actually said. There's no better testimony than that from an eyewitness. Today, in these difficult times of politics and COVID and declining Christianity, people are voicing their opinions more than ever before. Don't look at these as barriers. Look at them as doors of topics to open that would allow you to then talk about spiritual things because we see Jesus doing that very thing. And so now it's good to overcome these barriers and it's good to have spiritual conversations. But we have to address the elephant in the room and that is sin. And Jesus does it here so wonderfully, graciously, when he talks to the woman and he says, come, go and bring your husband. In today's culture, people may say that they believe in God or there's something out there, but they're trying to redefine what sin is. There's a redefinition of what is good or bad, what is evil, what is holy. And they don't want to broach on this topic of sin. They want to completely wipe it away. Because if you talk about sin, then there's a realization that there is a need for a savior. And so it's important in our conversations with those that don't know the Lord to address this. Jesus put his finger on what was at issue for this young lady. She loves something or someone else more than God. And we all struggle in our own lives between the flesh and the spirit within us. And sometimes, some of us, we're dealing with that just, there's one thing in our life that we just wish we could get over. And it's the same for the non-Christian world. Normally there is one major obstacle that needs to be addressed in their lives so that they can see truly who Jesus is. For this lady, it was her relationships with others. Her intimacy with a partner was more important to her than a relationship with God. And the Bible calls that sin. In John 4.20, there's a common response that takes place when you start addressing this subject. And I wonder whether you've encountered that when, with your friends. And that is, let's bring up a contentious issue. Whenever sin is being addressed in someone's life, let's just change the subject. I know I do. No one else does that? Okay. And so how does Jesus handle that? Because the woman here, she, she's saying, well, what religion is right? Your religion or my religion? Maybe there's more than one way to heaven. Shouldn't we respect all these different cultures and not tell people what to believe? And there's many other hot topics out there. But Jesus gently corrects her misunderstanding. Jesus said, you Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation comes from the Jews. Don't be like a Samaritan where you make up your own religion where you take this part of the Bible and believe that, or take this part of God or Jesus, but then disregard this, or add something else. Don't make up your own religion. And it's a problem that's happening today as it was 2,000 years ago. We must stay true to God's word. We must stay true 
to the leading of his spirit. Jesus said, the most important thing is knowing the Father when he said that you do not know, but we know. And then he said the only way to salvation is through the Jews. And we know, as Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. If you're offended by me saying that there is not multiple ways to heaven, I give no apologies because Jesus said he is the only way and only if you repent and dedicate your life to him will you find your way on a journey to heaven. So after correcting some misunderstandings and addressing some of these hot topics, what else did Jesus do? In verse 25, he said, Woman, oh sorry, the woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming, and when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am him. We can spend too much time debating all these topics, all these secondary issues. We need to talk about Jesus again and again. If, you're, if you find yourself addressing one of these topics, just say, you know what? I might not know everything about that, but let me tell you about Jesus. He's the most attractive person to have ever lived. And he's the one that we're bringing people to have faith in. And first they must declare that Jesus is Lord. And so in our ministry, you'll see when we have meetings, we do lots of crazy things. We have games and skits. Like any youth group, you'll see in these next photos. We have activities that interest teenagers. And everything we do is building up towards the end. Where the last 10 to 15 minutes, we just talk about Jesus. We don't talk about denominational stuff or we don't talk about politics. We don't talk about anything except for Jesus. And so I'd encourage you to think along the same lines. And so what are the results? What happens when you keep talking about Jesus? What happens when you break through these barriers? What happens when you address some of these misunderstandings? Let me introduce you to Lisa. This is her testimony. She became a Christian about four months ago. She says, hi, my name is Lisa and I'm 15 years old. I've really enjoyed being a part of Young Life. Each week... I'd come to club and hear something about Jesus. And then my leader invited me to camp. Here, I decided to follow God and I prayed a prayer of repentance. Look at that beautiful smile. That's her after accepting the Lord. Wonderful. And another story. This one's Margarita. She's in, Lisa was in Belarus. Margarita's in Lithuania. And she says, I grew up in a Christian family, but my faith was cold and God was not my priority. But by coming to Young Life Club each week and through conversations with my leader, Dana, my faith became my passion. I now want to tell others about Jesus and I'm learning to do this by being a junior leader in Young Life. And it's wonderful to be discipling her she is a little dynamo and she wants to tell everyone about Jesus. Now, as the story continues, something interesting happens. There's a pivotal shift because we read how the disciples had come back from buying lunch and they had interacted in town with the Samaritans. And they come back and have a bit of a surprise that Jesus was talking to a Samaritan woman. And then Jesus talks about being thirsty and hungry and how food isn't going to satisfy him because of what he's just done of leading this Samaritan woman to an understanding of who God is and who he is as Messiah and the Christ. And Jesus says in verse 35, don't you have a saying? In four more months, the harvest will come. 
But I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields, for they are white for harvest. The disciples here, they had looked past at the past and current circumstances. They had looked at the physical surroundings. They had looked at the conflicts between their worldview and the Samaritans. And they didn't speak that we know of to anybody about the Messiah being at the well just outside of town. And Jesus says, look past your circumstances. Look past the physical. Look past whatever is hindering you. For now is the time the Messiah is here. And that is so true back then and today. Now is the time, Bethel. Now is the time to stand up and get out to your neighbours, to go to the mission field, to reach your family. Don't wait for COVID to finish. Don't wait for a new political party to come into power because Jesus says now is the time. Let nothing hinder you. I can do all things, all things through Christ who gives me strength. Though I may not feel it, may I not be trained enough, may I have all these issues going on, may Christ's Spirit give me boldness and the words to speak to proclaim his gospel. Now you might be saying at this time, okay, it's fine for Jesus in Samaria to do this. It's fine. You're a missionary. You've been trained. You can do this. But me, just little old me, I I don't have the training. I'm just a Christian. I'm young or I'm old or I'm slow or I'm fast, whatever it might be. But what continues in the story? In verse 39, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything that I did, the woman said. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he did for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe because of your testimony, because of what you said, now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. John ties in here, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, until the ends of the world. I've heard that somewhere before. Acts 1 verse 8, of course. But here we see an untrained Samaritan woman, she's only just come to faith. And the very first thing she does is go to Bible college. No, she doesn't go to Bible college, does she? She goes to her neighbours. And this is the challenge that I want to give you today. You have been placed here in Rochester among a people. You have neighbours, you have work colleagues, you have schoolmates, you have family members. And Jesus is saying, be like this Samaritan woman. Go and tell them about me. And let me share one last photo of our team with you. It's been such a pleasure, even though we've had lockdowns and young Christians have said that they've been struggling with anxiety and depression and being discouraged because of online learning and all sorts of restrictions, We had 115 days of hard lockdowns in Lithuania. You couldn't go more than a few miles from your home. But we put a challenge out to the young people to say, let's look past our own four walls and let's go out. And so Dana, one of our staff people in Vilnius, she has been training with me, these three young Christians. And they've been helping us to reach others and so we're just teaching them to reach their classmates to be Jesus' hands and feet and this is happening throughout Belarus in our seven different teams in Belarus and I can tell you nothing has provided more satisfaction to my Christian walk than this discipling others to disciple others who will go and disciple others, who will disciple others. Lyra and I are going to leave a legacy in this part of the world where people are going to have come to faith because we 
preached the gospel. And then we taught them and they're now teaching others. Will you go and do likewise on the mission field or just over your backyard? So just remember, this is how simple it is. The steps after you're praying for them every day, go to them. Get to know your neighbours. What are their likes and dislikes? What are their passions? Is there a topic there that you can use to open up to a spiritual conversation? Pray for those opportunities and then share your story. Tell them about Jesus and invite them to follow him. And as Pastor David shared last week, then you'll be good stewards of this land. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your son to cross barriers, to come to this world and to be an example to us that regardless of whatever the world might say should divide us, we know that your son unites us. And so in that spirit of what your son has done and what has happened in countless generations through the church and through family passing the gospel down, we too make a commitment to do that more than we've ever done before. For now is the time. Let those words ring in our mind every day and every night. Now is the time. Now is the time for Rochester to have another revival. Now is the time for our families to passionately worship Jesus. Now is the time for New York to, to declare Jesus is Lord. Now is the time for America to get back to its roots and say we need more of God in our schools and in our businesses and in our politics. For now is the time. Now is the time for this country to be a blessing to the other nations. No more waiting, no more delaying, no more excuses so that you'll be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> if you would like more information uh, on what we're doing, there is a missions table in the back where you can grab uh, some of our information. And for those of you who are already praying and financially supporting us and you're keeping up with our family news, there's a new fridge magnet uh, of the family you can put on your fridge because we really covet your prayers. Um, we believe in partnership and we're so thankful for Bethel and for all of you partnering with us in seeing the kingdom advance in this part of the world. Bless you guys.